1970, it was a Thursday, 10 to 12. I was 23 years of age. It was a nice sunny day. It was payday and in them days we got paid by cash and everybody was quite happy because we used to get paid uh, just after lunch. It was 10 to 12. There was at least two people sitting on the toilet, two men. There was at least two or three standing having a wee in the toilet. There were three or four men walking in and out of the sheds to get their lunch. Uh, there was people coming out of the bridge walk, walking to, uh, to go into the sheds. And people were just sitting, working, minding their own business. And then at 10 to 12, the Westgate Bridge collapsed. Killed 35 people. 18 people wrote it down. 18 people survived, but most of those people did not have a quality of life. John's father was a very good friend of mine. His nickname was called the Gentle Giant. They say apples don't fall far from the tree, but they have with John. <laughs> <coughs> but John, John's father came back and, and we brought quite a few people back. You've got to really have a look at, there were three box girders bridges built in the world. One in Milford Haven, it collapsed in Wales and killed four workers. The Westgate Bridge killed 35, and there's one in Germany that didn't collapse. Three box girder bridges built in this world, and two of them killed workers out of three. They don't build box girder bridges anymore today. About 10 or 15 days before the Westgate Bridge collapsed, one person come in into the shed, and you've got to remember there was no mobile phones, no computers. We didn't have the technology people got today. And said to a couple of people, he was speaking to his cousin last night in England, and he said that a bridge collapsed and four people have been killed. We just kept on work and we didn't really understand the ramifications. Then a few of the English engineers, because a lot of the people, Freeman and Fox was a company that designed it, they started telling us that uh, they'd been talking to their relatives and it was a box girder bridge designed by Freeman and Fox. So after a few days of rumours going around the job, one morning there was 450 workers refused to go to work. We sat in the shed, we demanded union officials to come down and it took about two days and we stayed in the sheds for two days. We had a, a, a meeting with a person called Jack Hinshaw who told us he was the best bridge builder in the world and he designed the Westgate Bridge. He also helped to design Milford Haven and, and also Germany that he didn't tell us. Uh, we had this long story from him how safe the bridge was, that uh, the bridge wouldn't collapse, um, it was safe, etc., etc. The management addressed us probably for a couple of hours, I suppose. Then they left and we were sitting there two union officials, and we're having a debate whether we go back to work or not. In them days, we just didn't have the resources that we've got today. The union officials did their best. They had as much skills as we had. We had a long debate, and all I can, all I can talk about is my personal experience. I voted to go back to work, not because Hindshaw told us he was the best bridger in the world, because he was on the job most of the time. He was at the coalface. So I said from my personal point of view, if he's at the coalface every day, he's there every day, and he thinks it's safe, well, that's good enough for me. And we decided to go back to work. And then eight days later, the Westgate Bridge collapsed and killed 35 workers. Jack Hinshaw got killed and he took 34 people with him. When it collapsed, um, it was absolute... Chaos, and I'm going to go into some details if people don't want to hear it, but I think it's important people know the whole story. It was absolute chaos. If anybody's ever been there, at the back of this room, there's a road, that's how close it was to the Westgate. That road was not closed for about an hour, I suppose. There was buses and cars going past. I can remember getting a body out looking up and a school bus went past us, and they were looking at us. It just wasn't, it was just absolute <coughs> chaos. When the fire brigade, the ambulance and the police turned up, they were absolutely useless. And it wasn't their fault. They just weren't trained. They didn't have the skills. They couldn't drive cranes. They couldn't dog cranes. They couldn't use forklifts. And most of all, they couldn't use oxy because 
people were trapped under steel and the only way to get them out was, was using oxyacetylene. We worked all day and those people really just stood next to us looking at us. They, could, they, they couldn't contribute anything and it wasn't their fault. I felt sorry for them. So the, what, the people who did all the work was the workers. There was a lot of workers on the Port Melbourne side because that's where we fabricated all the steel and we transported across to the Williamstown side. I was, I was on the river's edge. I was probably 100 metres from the bridge. And we worked all day getting bodies out uh, live people, dead people, arms, legs, it, it, was, it was absolute chaos. And as I said, I didn't realise it till hours later, my father was standing for seven hours on the police barrier trying to find out whether I was alive or not because there was no mobile phones, there was no communications. And as John said, most people didn't know who was alive and who was dead. The whole office and the infrastructure come down with the Westgate Bridge. All the clock cards, nobody knew who was in and who, who wasn't in that day because it was all flattened, it was all gone. The timekeeper, first aid, bosses had been wiped out. Everybody had been wiped out, not just workers. And during the course of the day, and, uh, you know, some of the scenes, and some of the scenes that we've seen, and be honest with you, um, there was, one, there was one stage where I'm a 23-year-old person and I should never have been allowed to see what I'd seen. We should have been protected and we should have been shielded from it. I mean, at one stage, uh, me and this other person, we were going through, there was toolboxes and scaffold and we found a, a hand, just a hand, just a hand from here. That's all it was. And we looked at each other and we decided to pick it up and we carry in this hand and we go up on the top of the deck, see one of the fire brigade and, and they say, well, oh, go over there. So we went over there. And if you've ever been to the races and seen a, a horse killed, they put a screen around. There was these big screens. And then we went in behind this screen and there was four stretches and they were just covered in sand. And the reason why they were covered in sand, they were placing body parts. Heads, arms, legs, torsos, putting them all together to see if they lined up. We, we as workers should never have been exposed to that. The last person that, that we got out that I was involved with uh, was on the Sunday. And he was under the bridge. Uh, we cut him out. When we got him out, the water rats had been at his body. All his soft tissues were gone. His eyes, um, his lips, his tongue, his penis, all gone. And the fire brigade said to one of us, oh, well, we're lucky, boys. He said, in another week, there'll just be bones left. And, you know, I'm a 23-year-old person, just a worker, same as everybody else, exposed to all this. So we worked, we worked right through to, um, as I said, it collapsed on Thursday. On Friday, we worked Saturday. They let us go home early Saturday afternoon. We come in Sunday morning for a couple of hours. And there were still two people under the bridge, um, but honestly, they, they were like pancakes. They needed, we had to get assembly, massive cranes to lift the steel off, and that took about two days to get these cranes because they're all over, all over Victoria. So we had Monday off with pay, and then we went in Tuesday morning. When we went in Tuesday morning, the gates were locked. We couldn't get on the job. So they herded us to this car park, and we went to the car park, and we are all lined up. And this engineer stood up and told us what a great job we'd done and how really, you know, how much they thought of us. And then we all got the fucking ass. Every one of us got sacked on the spot. We got one week's pay and we got our wages and that was it. See you later. Uh, we'll give you a ring. We'll send you a telegram when the job starts. So we were finished, gone. The funeral started on Thursday, Thursday and Friday. Um, anybody knows the western suburbs, the western suburbs um, um, graveyard was a, a, a big cemetery. We just sat there with car fridges in the car. As I said, nine funerals one day, five the next. And when we're standing at the, at the, at the funerals and, and we're looking, I don't know if anybody's ever been in this situation where you're looking at a coffin and you actually know what's in that coffin and you know that it's not, not a full person, it might, not, might even be the, the same person in the coffin. It's a horrible feeling. And as I said, we had, uh, we had nine of them in one day. We'd been dismissed 
Uh, we had no counselling, no support, nobody come to our homes, nobody went and seen the widows, nobody would have went and seen John's family outside of the trade union movement, outside of the organisers. There was no support, no counselling. And as I said, the bridge went down on Thursday. We dug bodies out and saved, saved a lot of lives. Then the following Tuesday we got the arse and the following Thursday we, we were going to funerals. When we got the arse, we were told that um, don't worry about it, when the job starts you'll, uh, you'll all get your jobs back and, uh, and we'll bring you all back in. So 18 months later we started getting telegrams, starting to go back to work. And in them days, uh, John can explain it, there was uh, the BLF and there was the iron workers. The BLs basically had all the, uh, all the riggers and, and, and scaffolders and cranes in, in the building industry. And the iron workers had the same, same sort of coverage, but that was in the metal industry. They refused to bring back the iron worker shop steward, who was an Irishman called Tony McGuigan. And it's always, this, always a case that always gets down to, to, to one person they don't bring back. And there was no arguing about victimisation or, or any of that. We're just not going to start him. So the iron workers went on strike for nine weeks. I went on strike for nine weeks to get our shop steward back. And I'll say it loud and clear, the metal workers worked every day. They never stopped work once. They got their steward back and they didn't give a shit about anybody else. So we're, so we're on strike for nine weeks. We went back on the job. I was in a, uh, I was in a, in a crew... There was seven of us in the crew. I was back on probably six months. Crane driver pulled the wrong lever, still come down, and one of the people I was working with was killed. So we lost another person with six months going back. So there were 36 people killed on that job. I don't think any job is worth one death, never mind 36. If you have a look at... Um, if, if, if it happened today, I mean, just have a look what, uh, the, how far we've come and 47 years to today. We would have computers, we'd have technology. I would doubt if we'd ever go back to work from that meeting. I mean, there are some legal rights. We would have had engineers, we'd had unions who, who have, who, people who have trained that would give us advice and we probably wouldn't have went back to work that day. That might never have happened. Also, not one job in Melbourne stopped. Not one job in Melbourne took up a collection. We never received any money. I don't think John's family would have received any money. And that's the way it was. If that happened today, no government in this land or no union would be able to stop thousands of workers stopping work and going to the Westgate Bridge to help. Nobody would have stopped that. And that's the way they would have done it. There would have been collections. And we would have got money. And people who were in hospital, families in hospital, would receive some compensation. We never got anything in them days. And the third thing is, I doubt we would have got sacked. I would have doubted if the trade union movement or society today would have allowed them to sack us three or four days after the bridge collapse. I would be very surprised if that happened. So that would change. I just want to say that I hope in 50 years' time that people are saying that the Westgate Bridge was the worst construction disaster this country's ever had. Because in 50 years' time, if they're saying that, that means we haven't had another one. We can't do anything about the Westgate. The Westgate Bridge is gone, it's in history, but everybody in this room can make sure it never fucking happens again.